Hello everybody, welcome to this uh, e-cancer conversation about prostate cancer. We're here uh, in San Francisco for the ASCO GU meeting uh, 2020. I'm really happy to be uh, today together with uh, Elena uh, from Spain and Axel from Germany. So this is very European um, oriented discussion or session. Um, I think we, we, we've learned a lot of great news in the last uh, year and, and again at the SASCO GU meeting, some fine tuning obviously. Uh, for example, for M1 uh, metastatic uh, prostate cancer, uh, we've learned quite a lot in the last five years with numerous uh, phase three trial delivering good news for the patients. One of them is Titan. Um, which is positive, obviously, and we had an, an update and analysis presented here at ASCOGU. Axel, can, can you tell us more about it? So, Karim, thanks for inviting me here. A pleasure to be with you. And uh, yes, since um, we had this uh, MHSPC year in 2019, after charted, after latitude and uh, um, the British uh, Stampede trial last year, we had the publication uh, led by Kim Chi on Titan where we show for the all-comer indication, metastatic prostate cancer and overall survival benefit, 33% advantage when adding apolutamide to, towards the classical ADT compared to just ADT in this indication. Um, this also uh, translated into an RPFS benefit as we've learned last year's ASCO. So with the uh, Ensamet, Arches, and Titan, this was really the MHSPC year 2019. Now we are here in San Francisco, year 2020, having an update on PFS2 from the Titan trial. Mm -hmm. And PFS2, I, I think it's somehow a modern endpoint we are having here. It's from, it, it includes first progression and then time to next progression. So that this whole time period somehow covered and when looking at the Titan data and the subgroup analysis presented by Dr. Agarwal yesterday in the plenary, it showed that regardless of secondary hormonal therapy, regardless of what has been given afterwards, if it's doxetaxel or abiraterone or enzalutamide, there was a significant and clinical relevant benefit for adding apalutamide. So PFS2 was benefit, mm -hmm. was positive in the trial, and this was a key finding no uh, further um, safety signals reported by Dr. Agarwal out of the Titan group. And I think this is important. And um, there was some question derived in the discussion later on. So what's the time from first progression to second progression? This is still something what is under discussion. And also what's the best um, treatment from first progression to second progression? So there's some, still some open questions. But um, to start with APA and MHSPC is surely no mistake. Right, so but just for clarity, does it mean that the second agent that is being added when apalutamide fails also works? Or, or do we have data on that? Because I know people are being confused about you know, the PFS2 concept. Yes, so it works, but it hasn't been really like cut into pieces, the results. Mm -hmm. So we have to await further sub -anal subgroup analysis with regards. This was like in the discussion also by Dr. Agarwal, uh, where he was alluding to the not final analysis of this question you just raised. Right. So, so I, I think it's very important for people to understand that. I mean, be, I mean, apalutamide, and that's true for, and to be honest, with other drugs, abiraterone and zalutamide, etc. So, uh, all these drugs work so nicely for a long time for the first progression-free survival period that even if a second period doesn't yes. really add much, overall, one plus two is big. So PFS2 is yes. big. So, so I, I just want to, to make sure people understand that it doesn't mean P, that PFS2 is significantly improved. It doesn't mean that the second agent added on top of, say, apalutamide is necessarily beneficial. We don't really know. We, we, we need to, to, to look specifically at this data. Totally agree. And also mm -hmm. there's uh, like basic research um, regarding to the androgen receptor that in theory, even abirateron post apalutamide progression should work, but mm -hmm. you're the expert on abi. Mm -hmm. So I think this, this should really um, work and we will have to await further sequencing data, especially in the MHSPC situation where we have all those great first line approvals now, having 
upper approved in, in, in Germany and Europe now since a couple of weeks. Um, uh, what comes next after failure? So there are some questions, but still some good data out for PFS2 for avalutamide here. Cool, very nice. I guess it's also fair to say that 2019 was really the first year when prostate cancer entered pers the personalized medicine era, thanks to the profound data, because it's really the first time we're going to use a biomarker to decide whether we should give a drug, yes or no. C can you sum up what, what, what we've learned? And you gave yesterday a beautiful presentation about the DDR concept and POP inhibitors. So where are we at the moment with profound and other POP inhibitors, Elena? Uh, yes, absolutely. I think the um, profound study has really started a new time in, in prostate cancer. So um, the profound study was presented um, at ESMO uh, some months ago, and it uh, proved the benefits of uh, Olaparib to treat patients with castration resistant uh, prostate cancer and uh, defects in the homologous recombination genes who have already progressed to an androgen receptor signaling inhibitor. So treatment with Olaparib prolonged radiographic progression free survival compared to a second uh, hormonal agent. So there was a benefit for, uh, the study has two cohorts. In cohort A, uh, included patients with alterations in BRCA1, BRCA2, and ATM. And cohort B, included patients with alterations in another 13, uh, 12 um, homologous recombination genes. So um, the benefit in, in was greater for patients in court A, but there was also a benefit observed when all the patients were analyzed together. So um, there's been presented also an exploratory analysis of the benefits uh, for patients uh, considering the different alterations. Mm -hmm. And it seems to be a very, uh, a very good benefit for patients with BRCA2 mutations, mm -hmm. and that is clear. For patients with ATM alterations, it seems that the benefit is quite limited. But for patients with other alterations, at the moment, I think we don't have enough data because there are some alterations that are less prevalent and we need more, more information. And what is being presented here is actually um, the data on the samples that were analyzed. And I think it's important to remember that approximately 30% of samples uh, fail uh, analysis because otherwise the clinicians may feel um, that is um, they are doing something wrong or or it's not worth testing. So, so what are the main reasons for failure? Just to help all, all the colleagues to to, to better know uh, because this is the, the near future using yeah. PAP inhibitors. So, what should they do to make sure there's no failure in the analysis? Okay, I think I think there's a part that we cannot prevent, and is that. Uh, one of the things they show was that the primary, the biopsy or the uh, sample from the primary tumor is useful to detect that there is our um, homolo uh, homologous recombinations defect because it's often an early event and it's right. present in the primary tumor. The issue with that is that sometimes the, uh, the primary biopsy was taken many years ago and then the DNA is damaged and cannot be, is not useful. So there's little to be done uh, on that regard uh, from the clinicians. Maybe the pathologist needs to, to see how to process the samples from now on to prevent that, uh, that issue. Other issue is that sometimes the um, samples that we, we have has a small proportion of tumors. So if you have a core biopsy with, uh, um, is affected with a prostate tumor in less than 5% of the tissue, what are you going to do? So we have to try to select the sample with the biggest, um, uh, biggest proportion of, of, uh, of cancer. Of cancer. And do you think people should start more biopsying the metastasis, especially when we're talking about lymph nodes or liver? I mean, we all know the issues about bone, but for soft tissue, do you think that should become more a routine process? So I think that for in the cases that when we have a sample that is um, feasible and it's mm -hmm. easy to take a sample from there, it may be informative, but not only for uh, PARP inhibitors, but in the near future we will be testing for other alterations as well because they may be predictors of response to other drugs that are coming. Mm -hmm. And when for DNA repair we may be using the primary sample, for other alterations we may require uh, metastatic biopsy. So I think it could be interesting, particularly if it's something that is accessible. 
In other cases, um, I think we will be able to use plasma-based assays. At the moment, this technology is in development for for. Um, but I think I think in the near future we will have also, which will make our life much easier. Much easier, yeah. definitely. All right. Okay. So I mean, basically, this was again probably the very first example of personalized medicine in metastatic CRPC profound, showing clearly that PFS is meaningfully, clinically meaningfully improved, and of course statistically, OS seems also better. Uh, symptoms are better, everything basically is, is, seems to be better. But you need to analyze the tissue. And at the same time, it was quite funny to see that the two presentations were, were made just together at ESMO. We had the card data as well, where basically that was not precision medicine. We were in the same setting of men, progressing after a berat to anoenzalutamide and a taxane. We were randomizing the second taxane or the second AR axis targeted agent. So easy question, basically. And obviously, cabazitaxel wins. We saw uh, the PFS and OS data at ESMO, and here at ASCO GU, we had the updated analysis with pain being better, with less skeletal weighted events, and quality of life is actually much uh, or better, let's say, uh, in, in a chemotherapy arm as opposed to an AR axis targeted agent. So we're earning more. But, but now that we have this data, on the one hand, you have an old chemo, if you will, four cameras, mm -hmm. that works very clearly. And on the other hand, you have to do the analysis, and then in a subgroup of men, you have a drug that works. Exactly. So how are we going to deal with that? What do you think? Yeah, I think that data is missing because this is one probably one of the difficulties of the um, um, one of the pitfalls of the uh, profound study maybe mm -hmm. is that we now know that sequencing hormone therapy, so we don't really know what is the benefit on on, on that. So we need to know, we need to learn how pa how patients with DNA repair defects do on cabazitaxel and whether will be best for these patients, cabazitaxel or a PARP inhibitor. And so I'm, I'm curious, um, and a question maybe to you both. Um, this is in MCRPC. We are talking about profound and CART data and the important health quality of life, patient reported outcome you showed yesterday. In my situation, like MHSPC, following failure of, let's say, apalutamide and enzalutamide, when you have a progressive patient, will this data, can, can this be translated into the MHSPC situation? Or would you say this is something totally different? Or could you say, like sequencing-wise, after failure, you give doxetaxel and then the best sequence is carbacetaxel or olaparib, a PARP uh, inhibitor? I guess it's probably true that of what, what we've learned from the MCRPC mm -hmm. setting will still apply to the new MCRPC situation, yeah. Yeah. Uh, except that you have to, to, to remember that your patient has been exposed already to an AR axis targeted agent, the one you like, abaratron and zalutamide, apalutamide. So all trials that showed a benefit in the post AR axis targeted agent will probably still apply in the new situation of a man developing CRPC who has received uh, an AR axis targeted agent in, M in the M1 setting. The, I mean, the biology seems to be, I mean, quite the same. I mean, the, the, the cancer has adapted basically to, to the agent he has seen. So, um, but what, so what do you think about the, the use of cabotaxel in your countries, in your practice? Uh, do you think the core data will change and that more people will be convinced that indeed we should use cabazitaxel as, as a standard of care for, you know, in the post-AR, post-dustaxel uh, situation? What, what do you think? So, I, I'm ahead. sorry. <laughs> yes, I think so. I think the, the, the CAT trial has proved that uh, sequencing is probably, sequencing uh, androgen receptor signaling inhibitors is probably not the best way to treat, uh, to treat our patients. I would, I would agree and go along with you. However, I mean, knowing from Kalaf and Kim Chi data, sequence ENSA, ABI, ABI, ENSA doesn't really make sense in MCRPC. Mm -hmm. However, um, the CARD population, but you're, as an investigator in the data, um, this were the very fast progressing patients. So it's a subpopulation of aggressive MCRPC. Yeah. So this was under discussion if this accounts for also for the ones that have a stable disease for, for years. Right. Well, actually, they were not fast progressors, to be honest. They had to have progressed within a year, mm -hmm. which is actually the majority of men on, 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 on Abbey or, or Anza. So, but, but you're right. It's, it's not the, the overall population. It's fair to, 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 to say. All right. So 
some good news in the last month and even yesterday. So we are still making progresses. It, it's fun to, to do GU oncologist in general or euro oncologist. Thank you. thank you for this conversation and thank you all for listening to us today. Have a great day. Thank <laughs> you.